This should be good. Let's see why I go on with this one. Get this away. Yeah, let's go here. Having friends in high places is a cheat code to becoming successful in any industry, but sometimes it feels like it's the only way to become successful in the entertainment industry. This has become more apparent in the stand-up comedy slash podcast industry within the past few years. The Joe Rogan effect, or the Brogan effect, is essentially that any comedian who is friends with, or regularly featured on the Joe Rogan experience, would have a significant advantage to becoming a wildly successful comedian or podcaster. Some of these comedians are hilarious and others are clearly not cut from the same cloth. <laughs> Even Cat Williams has been critical of the Rogan sphere. That would be like me being on Joe Rogan. Joe don't want me on that. I need to be on Shannon. Joe, Joe got six comedians that never been funny. He want to push out. Today we are going to analyze Joe Rogan's impact on the comedy industry and the comics who strategically aligned themselves with Rogan to advance their careers. Starting with Brendan Shaw, <laughs> who Joe convinced to become a comedian only to regret that decision a few years later. In December of 2014, Joe was sitting across the table from UFC heavyweight Brendan Shaw, who was just coming off his second loss in a row. And I know it's weight, but HGH and steroids just changes the whole structure of your face, isn't it? Maybe the video is always warped, but even the shape of his head is different. It used to be more like slender and rectangular and long, and now it's just like bulbous. It's pretty wild how it does that, isn't it? It literally changes the skeletal structure of your fucking face. The table from UFC heavyweight Brendan Schaub, who was just coming off his second loss in a row, this time by knockout. Joe spent 20 to 30 minutes dissecting Brendan's fighting skill and capability. That Travis Brown fight was brutal as well, man. To get beat up like that by your ex girlfriend's new boyfriend. Like, Brendan's had some epic losses in his life, innit? That's probably why he's so. He's so insistent on keeping a hold of TFAK and not letting that baby die. Because everything else in his life has been such an unmitigating failure. Imagine, your last fight in the UFC is you getting like laid out, laid on your, laid out, belly, laid out on your belly with your girlfriend, ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend on your back, punching you in the back of the head. Abilities and, and then blatantly and, and stated that he to you. Punching you in the back of your head and talking shit to you while he does it, by the way. The whole entire time, just talking shit to him is not good enough to fight in the UFC. The reality of your skill set, where you at now, I don't see you beating the elite guys. It's not that you don't try hard, it's not that you're not dedicated, it's not that you're not disciplined, it's not that you're not intelligent. There's shit that other people can do that you can't do. Now Joe was just trying to be honest. He was trying to be a good friend. Their other friend, Brian Callen, who is a stand-up comedian, chimed into the conversation to suggest Schaub had a comedy career in front of him. What I care about is the fact that you have a future in other things and you're really good at. Like, you're really funny. Dude, you know how many, f um, no, 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 you know many pictures that I've gotten sent to me that say, don't put me in a sauna, make me f my way out? No, no, <laughs> he say know. funny Dude, shit, dude. Now, when you have two professional comedians telling you that you are funny and you already host a successful sports slash comedy show, it's obvious that pursuing a comedy career is better than continuing to get knocked out in the UFC. So Brendan officially retired from MMA and began podcasting full time. Schaub has been featured on the Joe Rogan Experience 90 times, which is more than any other guest in history. His exposure to the massive JRE fanbase allowed him to bypass the 10-year grind through small clubs and dive bars that all comedians have to do to build their name in the industry. In but, less than one year, Brendan... But the funny thing is about Brendan... Brendan was doing solo so, stand... Well, the funny thing is about Brendan in this clip, which is I didn't point, which I didn't figure out, that list of comedians he put up there, right? He's the only one that didn't go through the 10-year thing on purpose. So he kind of fucked himself. He's got the most guest appearances, but everybody on this list did comedy the hard way, kind of, right? In terms of coming up and getting past at stores and stuff. So he's the only one on this list who refused to do open mics, refused to do like random spots in places, only for the, for the longest time, he only performed in front of his own audience, didn't go and perform at random spots in places, only did it at the comedy store, never anywhere else. This is proof that if he would have done it the regular way, he would be successful because the rest of these guys are still doing stand-up. Eddie Brother still does stand-up. Brian Callen still tours. Ari Shafir still does stand-up. Joey Diaz still does stand-up. He's the only person in this list 
who doesn't do it anymore and he's also the only person on this list who didn't do it the right way no coincidence there than any other guest in history. His exposure to the massive JRE fanbase allowed him to bypass the 10-year grind through small clubs and dive bars that all comedians have to do to build their name in the industry. In less than one year, Brendan was doing solo stand-up tours, and his shows were in front of fairly large crowds considering he had not proved himself as a funny comedian. He started another podcast called The King and the Sting alongside Theo Vaughn. By the end of 2018, Brendan owned and produced three very successful podcasts, was traveling around the country selling out comedy shows while being aligned with some of the biggest comics in the business My after just two years in. He then released his first stand-up special on Showtime called You'd Be Surprised. Now releasing a special is a huge moment in a comedian's career. He just did it too soon, man. He just did it all too soon. Looking back now, I still don't get what the rush was. What was the rush? He could have just taken his time. King of the Sting was going well. T Fat K was going well. Big Brown Breakdown got silent. Sh like, he should have just took in his time. There was no need to rush. There was really no need. He could have done You'd Be Surprised. Like, if he would have done You'd Be Surprised five years after signing for Showtime, it would have still been terrible, but it would have given him three years on top, you know, as ex to extend his career. There was no need to rush. Like, what was the rush, really? A stand-up career as well, part of why people do stand-up, I'm assuming, is because it's kind of a long career. You can kind of do it until you're, like, in your old age, really, right? It doesn't, it's not that physically demanding, really. So there's no need to really jump out the window and go crazy with it because you're in it for the long haul, you would imagine. as it stamps a permanent piece of their art that was carefully crafted over years of hard work. Most legendary comics waited eight to 10 years. Yeah, big up Jordan Ray, exactly. That's what he wanted, it's the money. Yeah, it's the money. He wanted the money up front. The money was just too good to turn down up front, which maybe he was right because even though he, he did a bit of a speed run in comedy, he didn't take his time. He obviously went in there for the wrong reasons, but it did pay off. Let's be fair, let's not lie. He speed run comedy, but it did work for him in his favor. You know, he's now able to live like a retired NFL football player when he's not really one. And, you know, have all these creature comforts, live in a big mansion, wife that doesn't work, kids are in private school, nice fancy cars. So he's got all the things that he wanted. Um, it's just that unfortunately the career, he's got the material things, but maybe the career thing isn't where it should be, given his advantages and what he's been given before they were good enough to release their first special. With an average rating of 1.4 out of 10 stars, it's safe to say that comedy fans decided that Brendan was not ready. And while- Yeah, he was on recently, Dusky the Flow. Um, Brendan was on recently. He was on the fight. He, they, they did a fight companion. He does fight companions sometimes. So when they do fight companions, Brendan's usually on there. The fight companions are with him, Joey Diaz, Eddie, Eddie Bravo, and Brian Callen. Um, but he doesn't really do solo episodes anymore. Solo are probably usually to promote a show or a special. Well, I'm not going to sit here and pick apart his entire special. His first joke about getting a haircut definitely speaks volumes about what he thinks is a good punchline. There you go, but don't sweat it, bro. We got Jamal here. He's very good. Just sit in the chair. He'll be right with you. So I sit in the chair. I'm thinking to myself, all right, clearly Jamal's a black dude. <laughs> this dude comes out of the bathroom. He's all, what's up, man? I'm Jamal. He was Asian as <laughs> Feel way better about this if I needed help with math or some shit, you know? I was just like... The joke is two minutes long, but the whole story was about how he got a bad haircut by an Asian barber named Jamal. He also made fun of an Asian doctor who was servicing his injury after his loss to Travis Brown. This giant Asian doctor walks up to him and goes, Mr. Shab, I'm sorry for your loss. He takes out the biggest syringe you've ever seen in your life, like he's out of a goddamn comic book, goes, Mr. Shab, after you numb your lip, you need many, many stitches. This be worth paying your life, guaranteed. Worth paying your life. As if the joke wasn't bad enough, this is the actual voice of the doctor he was mimicking. <laughs> I take care of all the fighters as well as employees within the UFC family. Even Rogan said big up, years Big up Dr. Greg Sue. He's, he's, he speaks better English than fucking Brendan. If you heard him on the phone, you, you yeah, I mean, like... <laughs> 
Because oh. later, that Shab special was a mistake. The first one, I would have probably tried to talk you out of it, but I already talked you out of fighting. Yeah. And I was like, I can't talk him out of this, too. Joe now admits that Brendan... Oh, yeah, I remember this admission. That's a very good admission, by the way, which is funny. It explains a lot. I I understand that. As a friend, you already to you, you gave him a bit of a bump with the whole retire from UFC talk, especially on the on the podcast. That was a bit brutal, especially the way Joe did it. Cause I think Joe knew he had to do it that harshly because Brendan doesn't listen. So it had to come across a little bit confrontational. But then to then tell somebody, hey, don't do this special so soon. To be fair, he should have known. I think he didn't need Rogan to tell him. He should have known. He should have got a feeling that it was a bad decision. But he did it anyway, as Jordan Ray said, and a few other people have said before, the money. The money was just too good to turn down for him anyway. He he was always in there for the money. ...was not funny enough to release a special, but continuously allows him to promote his comedy to the millions of JRE viewers. They both convince the JRE community that Brendan's second comedy special, Gringo Poppy, was going to be much better. And somehow, Brendan outdid his last performance, going from 1.4 stars to 1.1 <laughs> out of 10 stars. Rogan continues... Oh, see? Even the IMBD agrees with me. Remember when I said, you'd be surprised it's actually a better special than Gringo Poppy? And everyone in the stream chat was you know taking a piss out of me well even the imbd scores agree allegedly you'd be surprised has 1.4 on imb imdb and gringo papi has a 1.1 and it's shorter Continuing to amplify Shab just pissed off the fandom. This guy is my hero. Average fighter, average podcaster, terrible comedian, awful fight analysis. He's proven you don't have to be great at anything to be successful. Now I'm not blaming- To be fair, I think this is the American dream. I think this is the American dream. The American dream is to achieve the most you can out of life while being mediocre. That's what I think technically the American dream is. Because if you synthesize or if you translate, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that's basically what it is. It's looking at what others have. It's looking at the riches and the fucking glories and all the trappings of life and saying, I want that. And how can I get it? And then doing everything possible to go get it, even if you don't quote unquote deserve it. So that's basically the American dream. And he's achieved it. That's probably why he's so like con content in a way, because it's like he knows deep down. He knows deep down he's an average fighter. He knows deep down he's an average podcaster, a terrible comedian, awful fighter analyst. He knows that. But on paper, it he doesn't look like it, right? Because he's got a successful semi, you know, successful to some people's point of view career, you know, a decent show, a podcast, a comedy career just quit, a new endeavors like the car thing. So on paper, he's doing pretty well. But, you know fight analysis, he's proven you don't have to be great at anything to be successful. Now, I'm not blaming Joe for the mass yeah, hate. Yeah, exactly, Darsky the Flow. Exactly, good point, Darsky the Flow. Brendan is good at appearing likable enough, long enough for you to fool you. Exactly, yeah, he's very good at that. He gets you in. Like, if you don't know him and somebody shows you a video of him and you're laughing at what he does, some people will be like, oh, you're being mean. He seems cool. You have to kind of watch him a few times and then you start to realize, oh, this guy is a bit of a douche. But he, he's not immediately in your face a piece of shit, which is probably advantageous. Hatred towards Shab. He definitely did that to himself. If anything, this just proves that Joe is a good friend, willing to continuously promote his buddy despite the obvious lack of comedic talent. Which begs the question that people have been asking for years. Does Joe Rogan understand comedy? Because there have been countless examples of jokes sliding right over his smooth round head. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor. Basketball. Let me skip the ads quickly. or download Underdog via the App Store and use code PATRICKCC. That's Underdog Fantasy, promo code PATRICKCC for a first deposit match worth up to $100. It makes watching the NBA even more interesting for me. So rep your team and make your own picks with Underdog. Dolphins commit. Sports betting is so big in the States, isn't it? Everybody's into sports betting. It must make so much money. And judging by his smile, they're probably paying him a lot of money for this ad, isn't it? Interesting for me. So rep your team and make your own picks with underdog dolphins commit right. uh in fans sports betting they, is they like, kill babies they do it on god damn it bro you guys are gonna have a bit of an issue when it comes to gambling with these new kids coming up 
all these Gen Z kids, younger millennials, younger millennials that are getting you know hooked on betting already nowadays, they're gonna have a big issue when they grow up. It's gonna those those chickens are definitely gonna come home to roost. On purpose. Yeah. Well, they killed their own. Mulder was so smart and f thoughtful. He wrote my four best movies. That's why he died. I made Tusk and Yoga Hosers. Like without that dog writing for me. How'd he write for you? It's a joke, Joe. He was feral. <laughs> he was, he's just. To be fair, I don't think Joe Rogan doesn't understand jokes. I think he treats his podcast like a serious platform. He made a shift. I don't know when it happened, but there was a shift happened where Joe Rogan wanted his podcast to be a, a place for serious discussion with jokes already, but he doesn't let, he wants his comedians to go on there and no, when he invites comedians on there, he wants them to present a different side of themselves that isn't just jokes. So I don't think he, it's not that, it's not that he doesn't get jokes. I think he wants the show to be a serious interview show. That's what I think. I don't think it's not he doesn't get... So I, I think when he does a show and he records, he's in the brain of, like, let's have a serious conversation. He's not thinking about joking. That's what I think anyway. Again, maybe I'm being charitable. Maybe I'm being a Joe Rogan, a, you know, apologist and shit. But I honestly think he just wants his show to be serious. So he's in that serious mood. And when someone makes a joke, he doesn't get it because he's thinking everything they're saying is, you know, he's taking everything literally. Just saying he was so smart. Bro. He was so smart. How smart was he? He's so smart he wrote my last few scripts. Joke didn't quite land. Sorry, I was folks. missing something. Was I wasn't paying bad. attention. Since Joe Rogan has been a comedian for 36 years and is the highest ranking comedy tastemaker, you would assume that no joke would ever have to be explained to him. That all came from a pair of rich, noble, where, where, where were they again? In France? Wiggers, I In think France. they called them. No, Wiggers are white people that wish they were black. It's a totally different thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had the first one at our school growing. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Joe, he knows. He's making a joke about the wigs. It's a double entendre. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe Rogan. Fucking hell. Let's go back to that again. He's look he's he's proper serious. Again, in France. Wiggers, I in think France. they called them. No, Wiggers are white people. That wish they were black. It's a totally different thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had the first one at our school growing up, and they put him in learning disabled classes. The How first crazy one is that? Ever? Yeah. You guys are the first one ever? I doubt it. Joe being so quick to explain or take a comedian's words so literally is arguably more hilarious than if he just laughed. And to be fair, what makes Theo Vaughn so funny is that you never really know if what he's saying is true or not. But you could also not see your body if you want. Like, I'll go sometimes, you know, I remember one time the, I went like eight months like without God. seeing my legs. Theo's first appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience was in March of 2017. By then, he already had a Netflix special that came out one full year earlier. Now, getting a Netflix comedy special is huge today, and it definitely still was in 2016. But you have to consider Netflix had 75% less subscribers back then, so way less people had the potential to see it. It wasn't until Theo started making appearances on podcasts that he developed such a diehard fan base. So getting on Joe Rogan was arguably more important than Netflix, and it was on this very first appearance where Theo's ridiculousness and Joe's killing the joke dynamic was established. Like if a plane crashed, I already know I'm planned ahead, dude. I'd eat a Vietnamese guy. Why? Um, because it's easy. It's a starter move. If you attack somebody bigger, <laughs> if you eat somebody bigger in front of other people, it's going to alarm people. You got to eat a small person, so stature is important. I think if you gum down a Viet, people aren't going to be that upset at you. Well, the you know? Vietnamese people are going to be super upset. What are you talking about? No, like somebody's okay. dad. Yeah, they're sacrifice. They're more <laughs> understanding of things, dude. Joe begins to take Theo seriously and starts talking about why Theo's wrong here. But Theo is a master and is able to use Joe's own boring tangent as the punchline. But what is interesting is like Vietnam is one of the few places where um, Americans can go back to Vietnam and they don't seem to hold any grudge at all. Exhibit A. <laughs> <laughs> Exhibit A, man, honestly. <laughs> Theo told another story about being neighbors with and working out with David Duke, who was a KKK member elected as a Louisiana state representative. Instead of hearing Theo's insane story, Joe just began searching Wikipedia to learn about David instead. He touted himself as a pro-life fiscal conservative, was known as an ex-Klan member. He eschewed overtly racist language and instead pointed to crime in the city, criticizing affirmative action and minority set-asides. Hmm. 
Yeah, oh. I just did chest and tries with them, so I wasn't in all that. <laughs> you know, we just did basic workout. Title this, Joe interrupts another guest story to try and remember something that doesn't even contribute to the conversation. Despite this, Theo did make Joe laugh a lot. Some argue that the only time Joe ever belly laughs is because of Theo. Oh, dude, I used to do, sometimes I would do so much cocaine, my freaking eyes would dry out. Ooh, and, uh... Look at you grinding. You're thinking about it, girl. You go deep, huh? Oh, dude. But you're I, that dude. You go deep with whatever the f you're doing. I Let's like go. to get right on the f and I like to be a peeping Tom if I can. <laughs> I'll watch your whole family. To be fair, Theo did well though. Theo did eventually grind Joe down and establish, you know, I think Joe realized, okay, cool, this guy, this is how he acts, this is how he likes to joke. And he got it in the end. It took him a while, but he did get it in the end. And now when Theo goes on Joe Rogan, it's pretty fun. But God almighty, the early episodes are brutal. The early episodes were brutal. Dinner. <laughs> The demand for Theo Vaughn content exploded. The JRE Clips channel would post animated versions of Theo and Joe's conversations that received millions of views, since Theo's recollection of small specific details made it so easy to paint a picture. Every time Theo would appear on JRE, he received a huge boost in subscribers, helping him grow his own This Past Weekend podcast. On his third Rogan appearance on July 6, 2018, he posted his podcast with Jordan Peterson the exact same day, which became his most viewed video on his channel for years. Oh, wow. Despite the obvious advantage Theo had by being Joe's friend, he did not abuse it. He's only been a guest on the podcast seven times in eight years. Theo clearly wanted- Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Seven times in eight years. But look how much successful he is than Brendan and the rest of them. So that goes to show. I Again, I've always felt this to be true, but I have a feeling that although Rogan acts like a badass and is like, oh, I'm a- he has a good bullshit meter. I also think he kind of finds it hard to say no to his friends. And he probably thinks it's like, a, he probably thinks it's a responsibility for the platform he's been given and the money he gets. Because I'm sure he's one of those type of people that also isn't, I don't think Rogan believes that, I won't say deserving, but I, I don't think Rogan believes that he got, he's where, he's where he's at just because of his own hard work and dedication. It's obviously because other people have also helped, right? Like they've also helped to make the, the show what it is. I think he recognizes that, so he wants to give back by always having like an open door policy. But I think some of these motherfuckers have taken the piss out of that, which is probably why a lot of them aren't getting favorable attention now that he's in Austin. He kind of used that distance as an excuse to kind of like ice them out, Brendan and Brian being a good example of it. But I think if you went out of your way, but I think he also recognizes people who don't go out of their way to use him. He probably he probably sees it he's like okay thanks you know thanks for being cool and i think feels one of those people where he's been able to you know for seven you know these are seven appearances over eight years is pretty wild when you think about the level that feels at that he's only got those appearances but again shows that you know he's grateful for when he's on makes the most of it but he's doing his own thing anyway wanted to build a name for himself, start his own empire, and create an environment where people would understand him and his humor instead of Joe missing 50% of his jokes. And at this point, the awkward silence where Joe either ignores a joke or doesn't understand it, and then the comedian is trying to figure out how to pivot is funnier than if the joke just actually landed. Everyone has the right to be whatever the f they are. What do you think? I think so. What about Nazis? They have the more of a right. A third right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's right. I think it's something. That's a different word. Reich? Like Reich. Reich. <laughs> what does that even mean? What is Third Reich? I don't know. I don't even literally don't. I mean, I know what the Third Reich is, but I don't even know what it means. Take a guess. I literally have no idea what that means. You could argue that Joe's podcast is so multifaceted, covering a wide range of topics such as news, pop culture, UFC, cold plunging, alien conspiracies, DMT, chimpanzees, that it's difficult for him to immediately assess a joke when he is discussing yeah. something serious. Mm -hmm. Then again, why wouldn't you expect a comedian to crack jokes no matter what you're talking about? That's their job. Or maybe Good Joe point. is playing the straight man role, which is the partner in a comedy team who feeds lines to the other comedian who then makes witty replies. Lies. One person we can guarantee he is not playing this role to is Brian Callen. Joe and Brian have been friends for decades, and Brian has co-hosted the podcast 85 times. You would think Joe would understand that Brian pretending to be a tough guy is a funny gimmick since he is a small old man. 
I got bullied for a full year and it turned me into a fucking, if somebody tried to bully me, I'll show up at your fucking house and kill you. That's what happens. I get so angry. I'm not buying I that. I hate when he talks like that. I hate it. Hey, That's bro, not true. You fucking bully me. If I you know you, you try bullying me right bro, now, motherfucker. You know the problem is, hold on, let me handle this. Here's your problem. Here's your problem. You've talked to too many guys that let you say shit like that. And then it becomes like vernacular. And in case you're wondering, this is how you're supposed to riff with Brian when he starts running his mouth. I'm going to tell you this right now. Yeah, uh, yeah, boxing. yeah, yeah. Watch your tongue. Uh, okay. What's going to happen? What are you going to do? Use some of that <laughs> boxing you've been doing? <laughs> Don't you disrespect <laughs> <laughs> hey. but since joe has been a diehard ufc Brian. fan and employee since day one he is not even remotely interested in joking about it should they do something like that in ufc where different people that are more behind the scenes fight each other oh yeah these people man i forgot what their names were i, I, I did from a24 these guys annoyed rogan so much he could not handle that adderall schizo energy I, I, I forgot their names but you could tell he was so uncomfortable <laughs> he was so uncomfortable oh it was so funny these guys were legendary i think it was two of them as well and they were like literally like talking like you know when you you, you know when you're surrounded by coke kids and after somewhere this is that energy that they were giving which was fine it was cool but rogan couldn't handle it no so, you versus bruce buffer <laughs> no would you watch that? No, you want to watch people fight that are actual fighters. So when Brian turns on this tough guy act, Joe is convinced he's being serious because he hangs around fighters and hits the gym occasionally. Then again, you could argue that Joe is just genuinely sick of Brian fighters and hits the Yo, gym occasionally. Brendan Lee fell over with that kick in it. Jesus Christ. Like, the striking was never that good in it. He nearly fell over. Tough guy act. Joe is convinced he's being serious because he hangs around fighters and hits the gym. Hey, dude, occasionally then again you could argue that joe is just genuinely sick of brian and has been listening to his bullshit for years like on episode 2017 when brian was joking about shab returning to the ufc to fight Derek lewis he was throwing Derek lewis out there with no oh, gloves good lord but but wait hold on just hear me out do you want to die sir hear me out what i'm just talking about just shoot a blast double shut the, up. the ground and then we shut got that the f up shut the up. And despite being on Rogan's podcast 85 times, Brian Callen has yet to prove to the audience that he is funny. Callen has released four specials over the past 12 years and none of them were purchased by a major streaming network. All of them were released for free online and the most popular one- Really? Wow, I did not know that. I did not know that. None of Brian's comedy- none of Brian Callen's comedy specials were on- no way, that's not- that's not true. I'm sure one of them was on a, ch a streaming channel. Maybe it was like a 2B or one of those platforms before it died. He's never had a comedy special on, an, on a streaming platform ever. Fuck, bro. No wonder he's so depressed about his career then. But this is also proof that he's been failing for a long time. Why is Brian now surprised that he's not been included? Like, you've never been included since 2012, even during the peak of TFAT-K, which is probably around here, right? 2012 to 2019 was probably the peak of TFAT-K, you'd say. It was probably ending around 2019, but definitely this, 2012 to 2016 was definitely the peak. And you still couldn't get it signed to a major fucking network. And Brendan got a Showtime deal and you didn't. Come on, man. You have to know already that, you know, what level you're at were purchased by a major streaming network. All of them were released for free online, and the most popular one has not even reached 1 million views. Callan's comedy is just okay. It's solid. It's decent. Which some would argue is worse than being bad. Being so middle of the road that you can't say anything positive or negative. It just exists. Luckily, Brian has Joe so he can maintain his career and finances. Recently on the podcast, he tried to divert the conversation to get Joe to promote his newest business venture, Toehold, a luxury flip-flop brand that sells pairs for $1,000 and features really sick designs like Bad Mother and We the People. Sick. Hey, hey, put your toes on. <laughs> Six. Take those off. Shut the fuck up. They took drugs yeah. off. God Listen to him. Listen to him. Come on. So silly. I know you want to promote your goofy I'm flip not I'm not promoting Settle him. Down. I just got to even call him toe holes. Feel, feel him under your foot. That's probably why, again, Brent Rogan was happy to get away from fucking LA and being Austin. 
because these guys are fucking leeches, isn't it? Brett Rogan's had these guys on 85 episodes, like, and you're still forcing a promo down his throat. Be thankful he's your friend, motherfucker. If it hasn't happened now after 85 appearances, it's never going to happen for you. And then you're pushing those shitty... Only for him to have to divest... Di, divest, sorry. And I think the divestment of him uh, at Toehold was to do with the T5K subreddit. I think they were bringing so much negative... No, Brian was bringing so much negative attention to Toeholds. They were like, look, we don't want you involved, man. We'd rather you publicly declare that you're not invested anymore. Even if he still is invested in the company, just say you're not invested. Don't bring it up anymore because this is hurting our business. You guys are so toxic that it's hurting our image. <laughs> Put your toe holds on. Feel him for you. Feel him under your feet. Come on. You got to love Brian panicking when he realizes that Joe making fun of his sandals is not going to boost sales. But no worries. They put a quote of Joe on the website saying they are the best flip-flops he ever had. And this is not the first time a comedian came on the show to promote their product that Joe hated. Steve-O came on the pod with a bag full of stuff that he was selling, which Joe was not enthusiastic about, only to completely destroy Steve-O's newest business venture. Hey, let me tell you about about what, what what I'm selling for cheddar. You got a bag of stuff you're selling? Steve-O's butt wipes for your butthole. Oh, well, that's where generally you'd use a butt wipe. <laughs> yeah, flushable butt you wipes, You wouldn't use dude. it for your cheeks. <laughs> They're flushable? Right. Not really. Let me tell you something about those flushable butt wipes. Don't oh. flush them. Oh, yeah? No, they all clog. Talk to a plumber. Those things all clog up. They don't break down. Uh, they... I think that's one thing Rogan has always hate. I don't think he says it. If, I don't think he says it because he's probably, it's a bit rude to say, but he does make it very clear that he doesn't like promo like this. It's pretty obvious. He doesn't like it. He wants you to have a conversation. He wants you to come on his platform and talk about things and get to some real topics, have some ha-ha hee-hees, but he doesn't want you to pull out a bag and just start showing like he's fucking QVC. He doesn't like that whatsoever. They oh, get shit. stuck in pipes. Yeah. yeah I, I picked the wrong place to... <laughs> Google are butt wipes flushable. Flushable butt wipes. Are they flushable? They're not. They they yeah. tell you don't flush them. You're flushing a rag. Steve was like, fucking hell, man. Give me a break. Like, Steve was like, probably like, oh, fuck, all right, fair, fair enough, Rogan. Down the toilet. You're not even supposed to flush paper towels. T paper towels break down in your hand when you get them wet. Those things don't break down. <laughs> don't sell those. Joe quite literally said the words, don't sell those. As Steve-O stuttered and tried to figure out what to say, Joe proceeded to spend the next five minutes proving his argument how flushable wipes will lead to catastrophic plumbing issues that will cost thousands of dollars to repair and will harm the safety of the public water supply. Jesus Joe Christ. decimated the product and Steve-O thought he was going to get a quick plug, which again is a testament of Joe's character. He might be your buddy, but he's not just going to blindly co-sign whatever product you're promoting. However, this is nothing compared to Shane Gillis, who straight up said to Joe's face he was using him for publicity. In 2019, Shane Gillis was a buzzing comedian recognized by the industry for being a rising star. He secured the coveted position as a this writer for Saturday good. Honestly, Night Live. Big up, big up Patrick CC. He's doing some good law dives. I'm not going to lie. He's pulling some good weeds here because I remember this. Because there was a period where when Shane Gillis did get... This is funny. If people don't remember this. But when Shane Gillis did get fired from SNL, Joe almost like refused to have him on. I always feel he kept bringing him up. People kept bringing him up on the pod, but Joe didn't really bite for a long time. I don't really know why. It's still something that is puzzling to me because there was a period in time where Joe was a lover of cancelled people. Every time somebody got cancelled for something, he'd always have them on and they'd be crying about free speech. But he really resisted getting Shane Gillis on for a long time. He kind of like ignored him, purposely didn't want to hear it. He'd shut it down whenever they brought up his name on the pod. It was really odd. Having SNL on your resume is strong enough to build an entire career off of. However, Shane was fired just five days later, making it the shortest tenure in SNL history. He was fired for making a racist joke on his podcast where he used the CH slur to describe Chinese people in a joke. Two years after he was fired, Shane went on Rogan's podcast to tell the story. Two Shane years. was detailing the events that led to Two his termination years. and tried to make a joke about the conversation he had with Lorne Michaels, the SNL producer who was about to fire him. If I get fired here, whatever, I'll just go do Joe Rogan next week and I'll be fine. Anyway, I thought that was funny. No? 
What? I was like, I, I literally you thought. I literally thought that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought it'd be funny. Well, it could have been funny. Yeah, I was booked up though. No, it was fine. I, it was just funny to. <laughs> oh my god! Did you really thought that? Huh? I was booked up though. Fucking El Rogan. Truly, that was a conversation I actually had. Really? In Lorne Michaels' office in the middle of that. That's hilarious. I, it was, I was in pure fucking panic. Terror? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only is this awkward moment absolute gold, it also was the first time anyone had ever blatantly said to Joe's face they will use him to advance their career. Now, Shane was joking. The whole joke was that this was a stupid, arrogant thought. At the same time... Was it? I mean, you could easily argue that a comedian cracking jokes on Joe Rogan's podcast will get you more career advancement than Saturday Night Live will. When JRE was exclusive to Spotify, it averaged 11 million viewers per episode. Now that it's available on YouTube, I'm sure those numbers have gone up. Not to mention all of the channels that clip his podcast and cross post across all social medias. Saturday Night Live's season premieres in the past few years have averaged around 4 or 5 million. And that's just the first episode. When's the last time you saw an SNL sketch show up on your For You page. As far as creating an independent comedy career, doing stand-up shows around the country, and boosting your social media followers, Joe Rogan's podcast will help comedians far more than Saturday Night Live. Also, if Shane didn't go on Rogan's podcast to tell this story about him being fired, most people probably wouldn't even know about it. <laughs> I don't remember how brutal that was. Rogan was not impressed. And again, goes to show he definitely had something against... I don't know what it had against Shane, but he definitely didn't like him in the beginning. That's why he didn't get him on. Because if he would have liked him, he would have made the, the changes necessary to reschedule other people and fit him in. He didn't fit him in for a reason. Less than two months after his first JRE episode, Shane recorded his first special and posted it for free on YouTube. This one hour set was simply his best jokes in front of a tiny crowd in Austin, Texas, far from the glamorous, high produced theater performances you typically see. And this was easily the funniest comedy special to come out in the past few years. With 26 million views on Jesus YouTube and an Christ. average 8.4 out of 10 stars, Jesus comedy fans Christ. love Shane Gillis. And Rogan also loves Shane. Million. And fucking Brian Callum was bragging about his 70, 765,000. Gillis. Shane just has to hit him with simple premises like gay jokes for Joe to burst into tears. Armpit hair doesn't bother me at all. No. Doesn't On bother a lady? me. So no. wait, you like jack ladies with armpit hair? Yeah, a little bit you of armpit hair. You're getting close, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you're, getting, you're so close. <laughs> That's funny, man. That's as close as it gets. Oh my god. Yeah, I like a good buzz cut. <laughs> In fact, Joe thought Shane was so funny that they started a podcast within the JRE podcast called Protect Our Parks. Rogan, Gillis, Ari Shafir, and Mark Norman have done a three to four hour podcast roughly once per month for the past two years. Within those two years, Netflix bought Shane's second special, Beautiful Dogs. With Netflix comedy being more relevant than ever, this was a huge opportunity for Shane. Since his first special was posted on his own YouTube page, you could argue that maybe he got some biased favoritism. However, However, Netflix would expose him to a much more broad, unbiased audience, and he seemingly won them over as well. No, nah, come on, Shane is not mid. Come on, people in the stream chat, let's be fair, Shane is not mid. Come on now. I understand a lot of Joe, like, the thing about comedy in general is that we get, we get comedians forced down our throats, right? Rogan forces comedians down our throats and whatever. But let's be fair, Shane's one of the best. He's really good. He's really, 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 really good. Um, there's a lot of terrible ones out there, but Shane isn't one of them, let's be fair. Well, securing a 7.9 out of 10 star rating. Shane Gillis is definitely one of the funniest comedians to come out of the Rogan sphere. He is an example of a comedian who would have gotten to this level of fame and recognition regardless, but being friends with Joe Rogan helped speed up that process a little bit. But besides Shane Gillis and Theo Vaughn, the JRE community is sick and tired of the rest of Joe's core group. 
Ari Shafir, Burt Kreischer, and even Tom Segura are not celebrated like they used to be. In 2010, Joe invited Ari on the third ever episode of the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Ari was in nine of the first 100 episodes and has been a guest over 60 times, making him the fourth most frequent guest of all time. It's safe to say he is a day one JRE community member, yet he isn't exactly the most beloved. Ari is not necessarily disliked for his humor, as he is most definitely a seasoned comedian who will make you laugh, but on multiple occasions his jokes come off as mean-spirited and hateful. For example, four hours after the reports of the death of Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna, Ari posted a tweet celebrating his death and then after catching a huge wave of criticism from this tweet, he shortly doubled down with a video. As I know, there's always a lot of like hate and pain in the world and there's always a bunch of terrible stories and every once in a while there's a good story. A good story comes out. The guy who got away with got his today. Kobe Bryant is a god. I'm here in Charlotte, the home of the team that originally drafted him. Uh, maybe he wouldn't have that chicken Denver if he had been if he had stayed in Charlotte with the Hornets. But anyway, the point is. Dude, it's like... Rogan tried to explain to his viewers that this is just a part of who Ari is. No, I never want to say it's a good thing that he did that, but he needed to know that there are, are consequences for just, just saying ridiculous shit that you're not supposed to say when people die. And like the good friend that Rogan is, he even went as far as taking partial responsibility for another grown man's actions to try and take some of the heat off Ari's back. One part of me feels responsible. This is why. I convinced him that he could have an iPhone and that he could be okay. Just put a timer on it. I go, just put a timer on it. I go, my daughter has a timer on her phone. She can only use it for an hour a day. Just put a timer on your phone. And he should have stuck with a phone flip phone man <laughs> then again rogan simply laughed off ari's behavior when he decided to spike burt kreischer's drink with molly one night burt invited his friend and fellow comedian ari shafir over to his house to do a podcast ari shook burt's 13 <laughs> ari was a fucking psycho for this honestly Ari was a legend and a psycho for this. Imagine going to your friend's house <laughs> with his wife and kids and then spiking it. It's one thing if you like, it's one thing if, I know there's some psychos that do it. I don't know if you do do it, but I know there's some psychos out there who invite people around their house while their kids are in there to get on it, right? Cool. That's one thing. Adults doing adult things. But if you, if you like behind someone's back, spike their drink without them knowing in the midst of their family, like teen and 15 year old daughter's hands walked into the podcast room where they were going to share some drinks then ari decided to secretly slip a capsule of mdma aka molly into bert's drink without him knowing bert went into a full-blown panic and it didn't make it any easier big up um big up booth mcgee he's booth mcgee said it's okay to hate stand up i don't watch it is that normal do you guys in the stream chat does everybody here just watch stand up comedy podcast content but not watch stand-up is that a normal thing because I, I i watch stand-up and i watch stand-up comedy so i thought everyone watched everything that's part of it but do, do some of you guys just watch the content and not the, the specials wow i'm willing to bet that's like so you think the majority of people that watch stand-up comedy content just watch the podcast and not the stand-ups Fuck. Interesting. Wow. I just watched this in podcast cringe, Wingus with Dingus. Wow. It depends. I never watch it. I just see this up. Fucking hell. That's insane. There's a whole group of people that don't even watch specials. They just watch the po they just watch the videos where they summarize the specials and that's it. Yeah, a lot of fuck, man. No, that's a good, to be fair, that's a good thing because you're not missing out on much. A lot of these guys have terrible specials, so you're not missing anything. You're really not missing anything. They are so bad. I I usually get disappointed because they're not as funny. Yeah, exactly, Tony. It's, that's what I said, Tony. Exactly. It's actually, it, ha it actually hurts you more when you find out someone that you like on a podcast isn't funny on stage. It actually hurts way more.
So it's probably best just to kind of ignore that side of them and just focus on the stuff that you do like about them. Like Theo's a good example. Theo is terrible as a stand-up, I think personally. I don't think he's very, very average. But on podcasts, he's incredibly funny. So I'd rather just listen to him there. I'm wasting my time sitting through hours and hours of stop to fight for one joke. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <Wingo. So laughs> to stop and fight for one joke. Used to watch uh, Patch Special, but not anyone. Yanis Pappas and Joe Liss is good. You laughed more at Shob on T5K or Showtime. Yeah. Um, oh, definitely on T5K, um, Max. 100%. 100%. Two Bears, One Kind. Never watched Stand Up. No way. Okay, fair enough that he had to get on a flight early the next morning but joe rogan thought the situation was hilarious because i because he spiked burke he gave his friend molly that's not okay it's not okay but, but wait that's hilarious though <laughs> <laughs> still hilarious i don't believe your fake anger that's I, a real it's not, weird there's no, one there's no fake <laughs> anger in this i, I was weird one. here's what i did it was i, like I was be on your side with this Ari. Thank you. I but appreciate I it. I appreciate it. End of story. Thank you. No, he said he's not. <laughs> he said he's not no, that's not what I heard. <laughs> no matter if you're right or wrong, you can always count on Joe to be there for you. The reason he defended Ari so hard is probably because he knows he needs to give Bert Kreischer a reality check. Because Bert has let the Brogan fame spiral his life out of control. After Bert released his 2009 comedy special, Comfortably Dumb, he secured his own reality show on the travel channel called Bert the Conqueror. Despite this show, being the biggest thing going for him, Joe Rogan and Bill Burr sat down with Bert to tell him some harsh truths. Bert said, They sat me down and told me, Your travel channel show sucks. You're funnier than that. You need to do specials. You need to do podcasts. Burr remembers the conversation vividly. He was down in the dumps trying to figure out what the next move was, and Joe Rogan and I were just starting podcasting. Joe is 100% and the reason why Burt quit TV and began pursuing comedy and podcasting more seriously. But he did more than that. He invited Burt to be a regular on JRE from the very beginning. Burt has been a guest 37 times. In the beginning, the JRE community treated him like their funny fat friend who has some of the most ridiculous stories. He became wildly successful, securing multiple Netflix specials, his own reality TV show called The Cabin with Burt. The 2021-2022 Birdie Boy Tour was ranked number four in the top 10 highest grossing tours of the year, achieving a gross revenue of $23 million, selling 369,000 tickets over the course of 148 shows, and he even released his own feature film about his life that was in theaters. But the more successful he became, the more self-centered he became, once even referring to fans as pedestrians. It's so funny, a comic's brain is so different than a, than a pedestrian's brain. But it just got worse. His alcohol addiction got out of control. His health was severely deteriorating. He became more obnoxious, constantly interrupting people, constantly wanting to be the center of attention. It got so bad where Joe just needed to humble him. Both Tom and Christina are oh, very on. nice I'll, people, I'm gonna and be they'll be advocate. very. I'm gonna be hold, advocate. Shut the f up for a second. Or how about the time Bert tried to convince himself that Netflix photoshopped a different man's stomach on his body for the flyer of his Secret Time special? <laughs> Explain. My belly has uh -huh. it fallen over like everyone else's. When ne when I did Secret Time, I didn't realize that it already happened until they did the billboard of it, and they did the billboard, and I go, "That's not my stomach. My stomach's tight." And it was a, it was complete. See, you have the craziest, most delusional perspective. Tight. Realizing they're not going to budge, Bert tries to get Joe to compliment his shoulders. Thought your I, belly was smaller than that. I thought I was in great shape. <laughs> and they put that up on Melrose, and I saw it. I drove past it, and I go, "Oh, did they? They must have put someone else's belly on me or photoshopped it." Yeah, like, like and this then, is like when you go, "Like I have legit the best shoulders." I do. <laughs> Hold on, I do. I, I have legit it. great shoulders, like great fucking shoulders. Yeah. No, no, you don't. <laughs> Joe, they're ripping through this shirt right now. Yeah, but you say no, things you, you don't really mean it, right? Like when no, you, when you say it. things you know it. they're not true. I... Whether you think he deserves it or not, Joe Rogan has become the biggest comedy tastemaker in the world. I didn't even mention how he moved to Austin, Texas, opened his own comedy club, and created vast new opportunities for comics. By the way, can I be honest for a second? Can I be honest? I didn't know this politician was disabled until this picture. I swear to God, I never realized this guy was in a wheelchair until this picture. I remember seeing this on Instagram, I was like, oh shit. I'd never realized he was in a wheelchair until I saw this picture on Instagram. <laughs> and then I found out the whole story about him. I, th I guess he fell from a tree or the tree fell on him back in the day or something. I honestly didn't know that he was in a wheelchair before I saw this pic. 
moved to Austin, Texas, opened his own comedy club, and created vast new opportunities for comics to maintain their careers. Most comedians don't rely on Joe's podcast for their relevance. But going on there and cracking some jokes isn't all that different than the 90s version of doing a five minute set on late night television. The only difference is there's no live crowd and all you gotta do is make one bald conspiracy theorist who barely understands when you are joking laugh a little bit. And yeah, sure, maybe Joe has given some of his buddies an unfair advantage. The good news is you don't have to listen to them, nor do you have to buy tickets to their stand up or watch their specials. But one thing you can't say about Joe is that he's not a great friend. I value loyalty a lot. And I remember there was a moment when I was sitting with Joe and he had a phone call with you. Joe was getting canceled for something. Uh, they didn't want him commentating the fights. And you on the phone offered your resignation over this. I got teary eyed over that. Joe Rogan has been very loyal to me and I am very loyal to Joe Rogan. I have to be honest, I don't have a problem. I don't have any issue with Rogan platforming his unfunny friends and giving them a career. I think anybody with money, anybody with influence should want to do that for their friends. You should want to be able to just put your friends on. If you can change your friends' lives, that's amazing. I think it's even more amazing, actually, think about this this way. I think it's actually more amazing to give your friends an ability, an avenue to make loads of money on themselves than for you to keep giving them handouts. I honestly think it's a really, really good thing to do. Hey, let me not forget giving you 5,000 to pay, to help pay your bills or whatever. I'm going to give you a way for you to make sure that you can make a two grand a month, whatever extra every fucking month. And every time you come on the show, it increases. That also gives you the, the energy and the encouragement to do more content, to do more things. It's actually pretty good. The only thing that I don't like is the convincing people your friends are funny. Give them a platform, let them show their show off their fucking skills, whatever. But don't try and gaslight us into thinking your friends are funny. That's why he fucked up with Brendan. He tried to pretend like he was funny and tried to tell us he was funny when he clearly wasn't. Um, and then obviously when it all fell apart, he doesn't admit it or hold his hands up. It's like we just have to ignore it and keep and going. It's not. But with the fans were calling out rogan's or you know brendan's ability to be funny from a while back and he just didn't want to hear it so that's the only thing that i don't like about it but you know what can you do um big up Brad rogan as well best friend and definitely this shows you this video that rogan definitely got tired of brendan and brian you know doing a lot with him you know taking 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 and not really giving or doing much himself so he was happy he the austin thing happened at the right time he was probably already getting tired of those guys anyway so fuck it, let me move somewhere else. So I think even if he didn't open a comedy club, he would have just moved there anyway, just for the sake of it, because it's just got, you know, he couldn't handle all the shit that was going on there. So big up Rogan. And yeah, good friend, but sometimes the comedy thing's annoying. The Brendan story is a good bit, actually, in the beginning. Um, the Brian Callen revelation that he's not had one special signed to any platform is fucking wild. Um, really, when you think about how long he's been around, when you think about how much he would love to get in the fucking sweet graces of fucking netflix it's wild anyway my friends um i'm gonna i'm gonna leave love you and leave you i might be back later on with another episode but i just want to do a quick one now and kind of get through some topics i hadn't spoken about but i've got a few things to go on from before we're gonna do one final episode today um we're gonna do the end bit of the gold now we're gonna do some no jumper stuff so i'll be back in a few hours but for now we're gonna call it quits we're gonna end and I'll be back in a few hours to give you some more streaming content. Uh, if you like what you see, you see what you like, please make sure you like the stream down below.